didn't even recognize their Messiah when he came, and they ended up being responsible for crucifying their Messiah. Well, for that matter, why do we disobey? In each succeeding generation, why do we end up lukewarm? Worldly, as our fathers, can we actually learn a lesson, put an end to this cycle? of disobedience. You see, the problem of disobedience is really a po problem of agape love. Not appreciating the self-sacrificing love of Jesus Christ. Well, I, 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 think, <clears throat> I think also <clears throat> we're all selfish people. We all think of us first. Mm -hmm. We all think of number one. Well, they were born with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. we were born with that. And I think maybe this is what happened with uh, God's people. Um, uh, when we start thinking of self, we start losing that love. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, he says, Ernie is making the comment that when we start thinking of self, we lose that love. And it all stems from that old covenant promise that they made to God at Mount Sinai when they said, Lord, will Everything that you have spoken, we'll do it just, just as you say. All that you have spoken, we will do. We'll, we will obey. Yeah, it becomes tradition. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes a dependence upon self. It isn't motivated by an appreciation for the love of God. And so it can only... Well, it does spur certain reformations and revival through the history of ancient Israel, but they all seem to dissipate. And they were not genuine and they were not lasting. Um, it's the same problem over and over through history that we as a people today experience in being lukewarm as the seventh church of Laodicea. And having lost the first love, that is a moral problem. That is a very deep moral problem. Because we've just mentioned that the kind of love that Jesus inspires in the heart is agape. It's a fidelity kind of love. It's a love where Jesus says, I love only one bride. It's a love that, that refuses infidelity. It refuses adultery. It's loyal to one and to one alone. So to be in a lukewarm condition and to have lost one's love, that opens up a church to being vulnerable to all kinds of bales, to all kinds of gods. Because our natural default position is to go back to self-love. And Baal worship is the worship of self disguised as the worship of, of Christ. See? So Laodicea right now is suffering from a, a love problem. Problem of love. And uh, that, that's an issue of worship. Because our worship will reflect the kind of love that's in our hearts. If our worship is motivated by self-centered issues and concerns, then our worship will reflect that. <coughs> oh, you have your hand up? Okay. <laughs> uh, we can see that during the time of Elijah. And that's another individual that we're studying in our lesson this week. Um, about Elijah, and his story was no legendary story. Uh, both Malachi and Jesus talk of Je God sending Elijah back again before the second coming of Jesus. Oh, hello there. How are you doing? <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome from Canada. <laughs> And we're told that when uh, he comes, Elijah comes, that some Christians will treat him as King Ahab and Jezebel did the real Elijah. Could it be that when Elijah comes to 
bring a heartwarming message of God's love that we could treat him today like Elijah and Jezebel, or Ahab and Jezebel treated Elijah back in his day. In other words, could Baal worship still be with us? You know, the word Baal simply means the word Lord, L-O-R-D. And a housewife would call to her husband, Baal, come to lunch. Lord, come to lunch. And over a century of spiritual confusion, the people sincerely thought it was another acceptable name for the God of Israel because they were too scared to pronounce his true name for it was too holy to pronounce. So Baal worship had gradually crept in. And uh, Baal worship became contemporary worship, keeping up with the times. It was a real ecumenical outreach to the many secular people all around them. The people of Israel liked it. What am I describing here? <laughs> I'm describing worship as it exists in many contemporary evangelical as well as Adventist churches. You've mentioned some that you've attended. Back in Ellen White's time. Yes, and even in Ellen White's time, there was a similar issue, a similar issue. Worship that's very pleasing to man. It, it appeals to the senses. And uh, there's a lot of excitement. And it seems to attract a lot of attention and a big crowd. Because it is pleasing to self. And when someone stands up to say something, out of discernment to make a protest, they're the troublemakers. <laughs> That's right. They become the ones who are divisive in the church. So was Elisha divisive in his day? Was he the troublemaker? You know, think about it. Ahab and Jezebel were the equivalent of the anointed of the Lord in the holy office. And this was plausible for the Lord had made Basha, prince over my people Israel. Bad as he was, Ahab was the anointed of the Lord. And you, you know, uh, during the king Ahab's reign, it was a time of great prosperity for Israel. A time of great prosperity. So that the people naturally saw the king as responsible. You know, if the times are good, who gets the credit for it? King. The king does. The president does. <laughs> you know, if the times are good, if the economy is rolling on and everybody can, you know, enjoy a good life. And so the people acclaimed Ahab as the prince of Israel. He's a good king. There's a chicken in every pot. <laughs> Everybody's eating well. No matter how worldly, Everybody was happy. Was, you know, as long as everybody's eating and the economy is good, it's fine, no matter how worldly he is. Now, was Elijah a sweet, humble, and gracious fellow in his uh, approach to the king? Here he is, he strides into Ahab's office one day with no appointment, he goes right past the secretary. <laughs> and sets himself in front of the startled king and he announces doom. And then he disappears with a goodbye. And later he confronts Ahab and tells him directly, you are the sole cause for this terrible drought and famine. Now would any church board like to invite Elijah to be your guest speaker? You know, Jesus clears up a lot of confusion by telling us that when Elijah comes, he won't be a man with a stern face. He won't be a man with a white beard. He will be a man with a message. It will be a message. Now, thinking about Elijah here for a moment, you know, El Elijah was calling the people of Israel back to true worship from Baal worship, wasn't he? That was the real issue of his day. And so you have to ask yourself the question, what kind of faith was it that motivated Elijah? 
Was it faith or presumption? And uh, what did you say? You're too far back there. You know, all of our class members, they sit right up here. <laughs> all right. Um, w true faith needs to be able to um, identify the word of the Lord, know what the word of the Lord is, and separate that out from fanaticism. So everything depends on the answer, but if we don't have faith, you will perish. Now Noah had it in his day, and in his day everybody said, oh, you don't need to build a boat. <laughs> but faith told him to build a boat. <laughs> Why? Because of the word of the Lord. Okay. Abraham had faith. He left uh, his Beverly Hills home <laughs> in Ur of the Chaldees to live in a tent the rest of his life. David had true faith. He was a mere stripling. He was armed with a slingshot and five pebbles facing in the name of the Lord, the well-armored Goliath. Elijah had faith. He had to have faith drenching with water the altars on Mount Carmel and then praying for, for fire to light the altar. And he was also facing certain death at the hands of Ahab if the Lord let him down with no fire to consume his sacrifice. Was Elijah like some great super athlete, football player or wrestler, you know, like a Goliath type who could stride right in there, you know, and command, have a commanding presence in front of everyone? Did he have a great physical and personality stature? Was he a knockout boxer in the name of the Lord? Or was he a shy, uh, retiring, trembling human being like you and I are? You know what, I'd really like to see an actual video of Mount Carmel, wouldn't you? I would really like to see an actual video of Mount Carmel on location, but the best we have is what the Bible says about him. And what the Bible has to say about Elijah is exactly what it has to say about you and about me. Because in James chapter 5 and verse 17, very interesting comment. James 5.17, it says, Elijah was the same kind of person as we are. Elijah was the same kind of person as we are. Do you think that Elijah was tempted to stand alone? Seemingly forsaken of all. Yes. The faith of Elijah was a million miles away from presumption. He trembled a long time before the Lord. He, he knelt to pray about the situation. Day after day, year after year, he saw the condition of the church and the kind of worship that they had, and he prayed and he prayed day after day until some convictions began to arise up in his heart, until some discernment took place. And then the Lord gave him courage, enough to go to Ahab and give him the Lord's ultima ultimatum. Take your choice, O king, Baal worship and famine or repentance and God's blessing. And all during those three and a half years, Elijah had to pray earnestly, it says, in James 3.17, continually every day or he never would have taken his stand as he did on Mount Carmel. Now we're told that there were 7,000 that didn't bow their knee to Baal. That's wonderful, isn't there? That there was a remnant in Israel, but not a one of them came out and stood with Elijah. He stood it all alone. 